This morning, we, uh, we're going to talk about 2 Corinthians 8, 5, verse number 5. Today, this morning, is not a tea morning. This morning's drink of choice is orange vanilla Coca-Cola. If they, would, if they would like to sponsor, it would be great. It tastes like if someone took a cream soda and just put some Coke flavor in it. In fact, it's making me thirsty right now. And every everyone who's ever done public speaking knows rule number one is get carbonated. <laughs> because you'll just you'll just belch through this whole thing. And uh not gonna lie, I would always drink a Coke before doing a speech in uh my public speaking class, and I found out if you were nervous enough, you the, the bubbles would just go away. <laughs> So 2 Corinthians 8, 5, and this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Of course, we're still talking about discovering God's will. We're looking through all the explicit verses that tell us what God's will is, because you will be asked by someone what is God's will for my life? Well, let's look at all these verses that explicitly say this is God's will. I've been listing them up on the board, and then we'll know. And right here, I want to talk about this morning is that God's will is graciously giving to the work of the church. So in the first verses of chapter 8 here in 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing about the churches in Macedonia and their financial Help. So churches that were in this area of Macedonia, Macedonia was a Roman province in northern Greece. So you've got Greece down here, up here at the top. This is where Macedonia was. Uh, and for, for Macedonia was its own kingdom. It becomes kind of like how Rome does when Rome moves in. Rome takes over those, but keeps those provinces Kind of like how now we have states. America is one big country, but we have different little states because governing a huge country without subdividing it is very difficult. Rome did the same thing with their provinces, and uh, Macedonia was a very important one. And, and uh, chances are you've heard of some people that are from Macedonia. I've wrote down just a few people. Alexander the Great is probably the most famous Macedonian. Alexander the Great is the guy who basically conquered the world for Rome first. Alexander the Great conquers the known world. Then uh, when he dies, it kind of splinters into four factions, which is, it's crazy about this because you can read about this in the book of Daniel, where Daniel's talking about what's going to happen with all these nations, and he prophesies all of this way before it happens. It splinters into these four factions, kind of starts crumbling because a house divided can't stand. And then uh, Rome comes in and just sweeps up the world and, and owns it. So Alexander the Great, Aristotle. Aristotle is from Macedonia. That guy, uh, I looked up some facts on him. He was a great philosopher. Apparently he invented zoology. So he must have loved animals. Uh, Aristotle, though, I will say, along with other Greek philosophers like Plato, uh, did do, inadvertently, not in their lifetime, but much, much, much later, did do a lot of harm to the church, especially if you start reading Middle Ages uh, Christian literature, you're going to find the Greek philosophers are influencing them a lot, and it just really has no business being in there. And also, uh, it's not called Macedonia at this point, but Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa was from the area that was Macedonia. So if you wonder what Macedonian people look like, just look at Mother Teresa. Something like that. Churches in this area of Macedonia at the time of the writing of, of the Bible were ones that you're familiar with. The Philippian church was in Macedonia. The Thessalonian church was in Macedonia, and the Bereans 
Those were the ones, the noble Bereans, that whenever they were told the gospel, they said, nah, let's consult the scriptures and make sure you're telling the truth. When I teach lessons, I want y'all to be noble Bereans. Search the scriptures, make sure what I'm saying is the truth, and if it's not, I need to know so that one, I can correct it, two, I can get mad at you for 30 years because I'm a Baptist. <laughs> So that's Macedonia. These churches were in Macedonia. So whenever you think of the Macedonian churches giving uh, money and support to Paul, it wasn't just one church. It was multiple churches put together that helped him out. Now in verse 2, it says uh, of chapter 8 here that they're in affliction, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy with their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. So you have these churches in northern Macedonia that were in affliction. So what happened? Macedonia, even though it was a great country at some point, just like every single country that exists, America's not exempt. We talked about that this morning. Macedonia lost its glory, became a poor province. It was racked by civil war, and that was even before the imperial age of Rome. Uh, if you ever need an example of countries rising and falling, the best example of this to look at is Spain. Spain's history, I got real into that a couple years ago, is borderline comical because Spain always kind of teeters on first world and second world power. I mean, they're not a third world country by any means, but kind of first and second tier. Uh, my favorite is during the age of or the age of expansion where everyone's moving left. Spain, of course, discovers Central America and they find a bunch of silver. So they start sending this silver over to Spain. Man, Spain gets mega rich. Spain has this massive armada. Spain is doing great. Then they sent a little bit too much silver, overinflated their economy. Boom, they're back down to a second world country. Fast forward to World War I. Spain decides, you know what, we're not going to get involved in this. They sell weapons and supplies to both sides, get real rich off the war. Well, guess what? When you build an economy off getting rich off war, what happens when war stops? You get downgraded again. Well, then the dummies did it again during World War II. It's like, you think, man, it's just... I'll leave Spain alone. Let them run with their bulls. But what happens here is after Alexander the Great died, civil war happens. He has four generals that own the corners of his empire, and they are just fighting, bickering with each other. It probably would have been left better if he had just left it to an heir, but he didn't. So what happens is that they're racked by civil war. Rome comes in, kind of takes it over, but Rome's not going to pump a bunch of money into Macedonia, so it's poor because war tends to make people poor. So, it would eventually become a rich province after the close of the Bible age. So, the first century, poor. It eventually becomes richer, especially the countries of Philippi and Thessalonica. They become really rich countries. And my theory, just on that, it's just a theory, is that God blessed the area because of the faithfulness of the churches there. That, that's just my theory. Just like my theory for why fire and brimstone hasn't rained down on the Western world is because there's still faithful churches in the Western world praying for deliverance. Now, but at this time that we're writing, that we're talking about here, Macedonia is very, very poor. In verse 3, it says that they give according to their ability. And, and look at this. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability. They gave of their own accord. So they even gave above their ability. What does that mean? I like the way that Lamar Dietz used to talk about tithes and offerings. He would say, I want you to give past the point where it hurts to the point where it feels good. 
So, so there's a point where, oh man, I don't know if we can do without that. And then it gets to the point where you're like, okay, we're already in the hole. We're going to be eating beans for dinner. Just give it all away. That, that's where the Macedonian churches were getting to, is that we have this ability to give. I'm not saying go open up a bunch of credit cards, max those out, and give it to the poor. That is irresponsible. But I am saying that God is having us give to the best of our ability, sometimes even beyond our ability, but you don't really have to worry about it because, one, our treasure's not here, and two... God owns the cattle of a thousand hills. And as Lamar used to say, the potatoes under the cows and the gold that's running up under the potatoes. So God's got it all. He made the earth. He's good to go. Also, that treasure that we're piling up in heaven. I don't know about y'all. I'm not concerned so much with the gold and trinkets as I am with the people. I have begun to store a lot of people up there and it's going to be real nice whenever we get to, to see each other again. So what they're doing is they're poor. They're giving beyond their ability. Why would someone do this? Why would a church give past the point of hurting to the point where it feels good? And that's because they wanted to be part of Paul's work. Just like when missionaries come through here and we want to be a part of their work. They wanted to be a part of Paul's. Now, at this point of time, whenever uh, he's talking about the Corinthian churches, the Macedonian churches giving, is when he was raising money to help the poor saints in Jerusalem. We know through Acts there was a famine going on in Jerusalem. Paul's raising money to try to feed these people and keep these guys up and running. And the Macedonian church, who they're poor, is saying, no, we, we get it. We get it. Did you know that in America, I don't have any numbers for you because I'm just pulling this off the top of my head from a statistic I read years ago, that the people that, that give the most to charitable contributions are not the dirt poor or the mega rich. It's the ones that are lower middle class. So like one step up from dirt poor. You know, one, one medical emergency from going bankrupt. Those are the people that are giving. And, and that's this church. They're saying, we are willing to give to be part. We want to take care of other Christians that aren't just in our area. I'm a big guy on missions. Not as big as David Platt, but I'm still a big mission guy. If you ever listen to a sermon by David Platt, it doesn't matter what he's preaching on. It's going to turn around to missions. Just be careful. Listen to his old stuff. He's starting to get a little woke now. But they're raising money for the poor saints in Jerusalem. Why would they do that? Because Christians take care of Christians. That's what we do. So, so we've got this mindset now in the church. We call it the seeker-sensitive movement. I hate it. Uh, I will not ever advocate for a seeker-sensitive movement because I believe it's wrong. Because what we try to do is if we can get them in the doors... Then, then maybe we can get them saved. That, that's not how the Christian's supposed to be. We're not supposed to pull people in. We're supposed to go out. That's the way it works. We expand, not pull in. But the thing is, is whenever you do that, the Bible even says that if you have a weaker brother with you who cannot eat the meat that was sacrificed to idols, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to offend the unbeliever that's serving you because it's better to offend an unbeliever than it is to offend your brother. Now coach him up, get him where, eventually train him up and teach him where he can eat that meat, but it's better to offend an unbeliever than a Christian. And I'm here to say that in the seeker sensitive movement, they will say, well, you just lost a convert. And I'm here to say that that's not the way that works because eventually that man's going to hit a point where he's going to say, I need a brother. And those guys seem to have figured it out. I have found that boldness, it'll get some angry responses, but it also gets respectful responses. That is to say that people may not like your message, but they will respect you for telling them the truth because they get fed enough lies. A little bit of truth feels nice every now and then. 
So the Macedonian Christians, they were concerned about other saints and the spreading of the Christian message. And what they did is they put their money where their mouth was. Not all of us can go out and be missionaries. Personally, I think it would be a super cool job. And just like the Lord always does, anytime I think something's real cool, he's like, no, I don't want you to do that. (laughs) So uh, it's not for me to go be a missionary. See, I, I don't require a lot of amenities Me and Danny Langs, we spent our early 20s in tents out in the woods. Uh, I don't even much care for water, so like, send me to the desert, that's fine. Uh, I've got the head for a turban, it's okay. And, but the thing is, is that that's not where God wants me to be. I don't know why, but there we are. But the Macedonian Christians are like, we're too poor. We, like I said a few weeks ago, travel's expensive. Now, travel was really expensive then. And they're, they're like, we can't go to Jerusalem to help. But what we can do is we can finance help through Paul. So they did. And this verse shows that it was the will of God for them to do that. First, these Macedonian Christians, they they got the order right. They gave themselves to the Lord. They humbled themselves before him. Look at that in verse number eight. I'm not speaking, or where was it? Let me scroll back up here. Five. But first, they gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. They gave themselves to the Lord. They humbled themselves before him. What what does that mean? That means that chances are they asked for guidance on what to do with their money. To which I want to tell you, be careful when turning your money over to God. He will give a bunch away. If you are willing to turn your finances over to God, your priorities tend to change. I've got to get this money to the church. And that's what I tend to tell people whenever they uh, uh, ask for, for charitable givings. Like, like I, I'm never, when you're at the, the fast food restaurant, would you like to donate a dollar to what's it called? I've done the I've done the the research on that stuff, man. That's just a way for them to make more money. Barely any of that dollar goes out to where it's supposed to be. But you want to know what institution takes in money and pushes it out into the community? That's called the local church. A faithful church will be investing more money per dollar into the community than most 501c3 nonprofits will. Which, of course, there are good nonprofits, but they do have some overhead. A local church tends to have pretty low overhead because it has a bunch of suckers like me that just volunteer for free. So, and honestly, you could try to offer, offer me money. I wouldn't take it. I've, uh, in the words of a great theologian, mo money, mo problems. So what they do is that if you turn your money over to God, God's going to have you do things with it that you're not going to see immediate benefits from. Because God doesn't invest in an earthly sense. God tends to invest in a heavenly sense. I'm not saying drive yourself to poverty, but I'm saying that God, he'll take care of you, but he's got some ideas from your money. They also gave themselves not only to the Lord, first they gave themselves to the Lord, but then they gave themselves to church leadership. They humbled themselves before Paul and the apostles. They had received guidance from the Lord and they wanted to do his will by supporting Paul in helping the Jerusalem saints. So not only did the Macedonian churches get synced up with God's will to give, but they trusted God's ordained leadership that they would do what is right with the money. Now, I imagine that Paul probably had to spend a little bit of those donations to buy food, 
if he wore out his sandals, he probably had to buy him a set of sandals. So he probably had a little bit of overhead, but his main concern, his job, you could say, was I've got to get relief to Jerusalem. And that's what he did. So I imagine Paul was probably pretty frugal, especially since he talked about he knows how to abound and he knows how to be absolutely broke. So on that note, there should never, ever be a such thing as a stingy Christian. It's clear that God wants us to financially support each other and support Christian activity. Now, before y'all call me a dirty socialist, I want to uh, identify what that means. That means you support the local community that acts. It details folks willingly selling their possessions to help each other out. That's not a communistic system. That's men that had needs and other ones that had ways to finance those needs. Now, how does that happen into the community? Well, Lord, the Lord has put us in certain circles. If I see one of our good friends, if somebody in the church doesn't have a place to live, guess what we're probably going to do in the church? We're probably going to find some sort of way to get a roof over those people. And that's what they're doing in Acts. If I see Danny Lang starts to get a little skinny and I find out he's not eating, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to have Faith cook some high-fat tacos and we are going to get those inside that guy. We are going to take care of our local circle. The thing is, is that we may not be able to have a giant platform like Billy Graham, but guess what? I don't think God is going to be disappointed when we get to heaven and, and, and we say we tried to do everything we could for North Georgia, but man, we couldn't get to Africa. I don't feel like he's going to hold that against us because he's put us where we're supposed to be for a reason. Not only that, that includes supporting the local church. Without local churches, there can be no worldwide church. Remember, we're not to forsake gathering together. 2020 uh, really tried to pull that apart. Man, we got to get back together stuck like glue, uh, like a rubber band. It may, may can try to stretch us out. We're going to come back to where we're supposed to be because we have to support the local church so the local church can support and help us support the community. Not only that, here's, here's the fun one. You're welcome, Kevin. The pastor's wage. Support the pastor's salary. 1 Timothy 5 speaks of paying your elders. They work hard and they're worthy of double honor. Uh, that's one of the things that people don't really understand until you start getting involved in the church, kind of like how all of we are, is the amount of work that you see a pastor going through, counseling, the, the burden that he has to carry for the people, the amount of prayer that has to go around this building, the amount of study that it takes. My goodness. I know how much it takes just to do a 30, 45 minute lesson for this class to get up there and preach a sermon. It takes a full week of hard labor and he does it three times. So the pastor's wage, pay that guy. You're welcome, Kevin. Not only that, missions. The Macedonians didn't just give to Paul to support the Macedonian churches. They gave to support churches in the other parts of the world. Which is crazy because not all of us are called to travel, but we, we can always fund someone that is. There's always missionaries that God's calling to get moved out and about. One of my, one of my favorite uh, missionary, uh, I guess you could say businesses, programs, it's called the Master's Seminary. And what they do is that they set up little training seminaries in other parts of the world and they get local people in there local pastors and they train these pastors and they give them a good biblical education and you know what those pastors do they go back to their churches and they teach their people and then guess what their people do they teach the next people and the next people and the next people. I love that stuff. I love that stuff. But I like teaching because I don't like ignorant people. And not only that, giving to missions, giving to the poor. The poor in Jerusalem were the recipients of Paul's collections. Also, at the time of the Jerusalem council there in uh, Acts, 
Before Paul and Silas were sent to Antioch, what were they told? Remember the poor. Remember the poor. And one of the best ways to help the poor is through the church. The church aids the poor. Now, does that always mean throwing money? I work downtown for uh, seven years, and there's a lot of homeless folk down there. I learned a lot about the homeless folk down in Chattanooga, and I learned one thing about them is that they like cash. If you tried to give them a sandwich, a lot of the times they'd get mad at you. Now, there were some that were down on their luck that would accept a sandwich from you, or if you'd take them to lunch, they'd be proud of it, but they wanted cold, hard cash. Now, so throwing money at the poor, and by the way, whenever we think poor, we tend to think it's synonymous with homelessness, Poor doesn't always mean that you don't have a roof over your head. I think, I think that's something that, that we can learn of working through kids with a wants. And so what this is, is that I, I started thinking, how in the world did these first century Christians give to the poor? And I thought of Paul traveling around raising money so that the people at Jerusalem could eat. And then I thought about Jesus, who he was poor. And was concerned with the poor. How did Jesus help the poor? He taught them. He taught the poor. He educated the poor. So there's more than one way. Honestly, I'm broke. I'm always broke. At this point, I just assume it's God's will for me to be broke at all times. I think faith has money, but I don't have any. And so uh, there's not a lot of things that I can do financially without running it through my secretary but I have time. I have certain gifts I can use to help people, and that's what we're to do. So, I'll tell you what, it's 10.30. We're not going to go into another one. To summary, the, the summary is this. Don't be so attached to your money that you forsake the will of God. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. You're either going to be a slave to money or you're going to be a slave to God. You can't choose both i'm not a greedy guy you can ask my wife as soon as it hits my hand i like to spend it that's why i don't let it hit my hand i just give it to her and so the fact is is that if you are so attached with money honestly we talk about these billionaires like elon musk jeff bezos uh bill gates and honestly i feel bad for those guys with their billions and billions of dollars. Because you want to know what happens when you get a billion dollars? You want a second billion, and then a third billion, and then a fourth billion. I am kind of jealous that money bought Elon Musk hair, but we'll, we'll, that's fine. It's fine. It's fine. But the fact is that God's will for us is to give, and to give graciously according to our measure. So I may not have as much as you. You may not have as much as me. That doesn't matter. But are we giving? Are we giving? So giving, it does take planning and it does take financial responsibility. Don't spend more than you make or giving will be extremely hard. If you are in layers and layers and layers and layers of debt, giving is going to be very, very difficult. Honestly, I'm a big advocate of simple living. That's what mom and dad did. And man, I think they were on to something. I think I, I might try to strive for some of that simple living. But the fact is, is that the more you give, the more you're doing the will of God. And the thing that people hate about giving, and I'll tell you why giving is such a hard thing, is that giving requires sacrifice. But if you're going to serve a God... You have to sacrifice to that God. And honestly, your money is the least of things that God requires of you because he requires your whole body. <laughs> Make your body a living sacrifice. So money should be easy if you're giving him all that.